Thank you, Thomas and Camwell. Uh, it's fun. I know familiar faces, and then I'm looking at name tags, and I'm seeing names that have shown up on our uh, on our online courses as well. So welcome. Uh, as always, I must begin every lecture, every course I teach with a thank you to the three main teachers I had in China. Uh, I had a lot of people that were very influential, but three main people I spent a lot of years with who really set the foundations, the standards, uh, and required a certain commitment from me. Uh, without them, I would not be here in front of you today. Um, as Thomas said, that a lot of people have studied in China, and it's very hard to find teachers who demand something out of you and then hold you to it and then give you a really hard time if you don't meet those standards uh, because they're embarrassed if you go out and represent them poorly as opposed to going out and representing them financially. Uh, and that was the time that I was there in the 80s, 90s, and in the 2000s. All three of those teachers have passed, and honestly, with each day, each year, I miss them more and more, because um, in the Shang Hanlin's preface, John Zhongjing says, wager one year, there's no one left to ask. And of course, there's lots of people to ask, and you can look in the books, but uh, Kao Shan, to rely upon the mountain, is a Chinese expression, I've lost my mountains. You know, I used to be able to just drive over and say, I have a question, I have a patient, I have a, a difficulty with this passage, and one of those three people in the times I met them, would have been like, ah, oh. and the more I am venturing out in my own world of trying to be the mountain for other people, the more I really miss having those mountains behind me. Um, they are in the order I met them, Professor Wang Jinhui, Dr. Xie Pei Qi, and Professor Li Hongxia. As to myself, uh, with the internet as it is today, I'm going to spend no time introducing myself or my history. A quick search We'll t on the internet, we'll show you and you will find more about me and videos. You'll probably even find some clips of me here at Camo giving talks on being a traditional herbalist, being a traditional acupuncturist. Julianne has uh, presented here, so um, do all of that. Is If you want to know more, look us up. Now, I'd like to thank Thomas because we've been going back and forth for years when I, we first met. Uh, and he invited me back, and he's letting me speak out on a topic I feel really passionate about. Uh, at this point in time, in 2019, February, uh, I am still pigeonholed or have a mistaken reputation as being the chief focused acupuncture bodywork guy. And Julianne, my wife, has the mistaken reputation of being the herbalist. And so we'll get people who contact us and say, well, I have an herbal problem and a physical problem. So should I schedule appointments with both of you? And of course, both of us, neither of us practice a specialized medicine of one or the other. We practice herbs, acupuncture, body work, Taoian, advice, whatever it is. Uh, and this, this funny idea that I'm the acupuncturist and she's the herbalist, and it's part of our fault. Uh, the seminars that I teach, the topics that are available for study in our online uh, training center, are those topics. But as those of you who've taken programs with us and been in our clinic, some of you have actually, three of you here have been in our clinic in Asheville, um, you become aware that if you make the journey to observe in our clinic and you follow our treatments, you will discover that our tangible results for the very serious conditions we see can only happen because over 90% of our patients are taking custom formulas along with physical treatments, right? And so everyone learns all the acupuncture from myself and they learn all the herbs from Julianne and then they can't figure out why they're not getting the same results we're getting. And that's because we combine them together. But we have in our internal patients, probably over 95% of them are taking herbs and they are taking their herbs. Um, Taking herbs is like having a treatment every day, twice a day. That's what we tell our patients. When they sit down on that first intake and that 40 minutes goes up, most of the time, all we've had time to do is an intake, tell them what we think, create a treatment strategy for them saying, I think you need to come in once a week, twice a week, every few weeks. You need to come in a lot for a week or two and then not come for a while, but they leave with an herbal formula. And we tell them, taking herbs is like having a treatment every day, twice a day. Now, if they can come into our clinic, and I say this to them, if you can come in twice a day, 
and I can make time for you twice a day, which I can't. And you could afford what it costs to do two treatments a day, just like your herbs. Maybe we could get the same results. But why would we do that when you can get a treatment, go home and get that treatment twice or three times a day with herbs? So given that we don't have the time to do that daily treatment, and if you spent time in China, uh, getting sick is almost like an ex to get, you get to step out of life and you can go three, week, three times a week, four times a week, seven times a week if you're on the, you know, the government's health system and you aren't really that employed. Um, that's not something that we can do. And so with herbs, they're the most important tool we have to truly reverse severe conditions in a short period of time. And that's critical because... <laughs> We need to make sure we're highly effective in a short period of time with a good, strong formula to get the patient's attention, get the illness's attention, and reframe the thinking that Chinese medicine is a slow medicine for chronic conditions only. Because if we look at the old books, not one of them is a famous book on treating chronic conditions for a long period of time, All right? Uh, not Sun Samyal's books, All right? Not Zhang Zhongjing book. The Neijing is not like, well, they're sort of sick. So, I mean, right? All the books that we venerate are acute medicine, strong formulas, and yet we've had this, this inversion of how we're practicing. So when Thomas and I began chatting about the difficulty facing practitioners who've not crossed over into a serious herbal practice, he was kind enough to let me speak tonight on this topic, as well as we're publishing a series of writings on the Camo website called The Practical Herbalist. Two have been up. Uh, another one's coming in. They come out every other Friday or every few Fridays. Uh, and it's really laying out the practical side of being an herbalist. You know, don't have ma huang? Drink three cups of coffee, right? Just some flexibility of what we're trying to really challenge this idea of this heady idea of herbalism. Uh, you can already find the first two installments on the Camo website. We're gonna keep releasing articles until absolutely everyone who wishes to be able to use herbs flexibly and effectively can. It's just information. It's just seeing it done. Because moving beyond fixed formulas and already made patents is really, really easy. Right? Now, I don't know how many of us in this room are familiar with the term a Copernican inversion. Uh, referring to Copernicus, it's when in a single moment, we undergo a radical shift in perception, and the world literally changes. One moment, the sun revolves around the earth, and then he realizes that, wham, suddenly the earth is revolving around the sun. It's a sudden moment, and that inversion of thought is called a Copernican inversion. Uh, everything changed for him and for us, but nothing actually physically changed. He didn't realize that, and then all of a sudden everything jolted and the planet fell apart because things changed. Physically, nothing changed. And yet, the perception, the 180-degree shift of how we think, when we think about that shift of what it must have been like, it almost gives us vertigo when you think that moment of realizing that the sun's not moving around us, we're moving around the sun. Now, that was a positive shift, a leap forward in thinking. But herbalism has sadly undergone a negative Copernican inversion. We've gone from simple and practical and part of everyday life to a heady practice with massive memorization and complicated theories, making it seem like the great practitioners and pr teachers of yesterday and today are like chess masters who see more steps and are smarter than we are, us, the normal people. Like, oh, that, that person, he can do it because they're really smart. She's really, 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 really smart. And it, it, it's taken on this idea of this, the, the really special people do that at that level. And I laugh when I think about this because I have copernically shifted back and forth so many times on the study of herbs and medicine that I probably have what I like to call several intellectual concussions, right? I mean, just whap, the brain in there is going back and forth. Now, I was an eager 20-year-old in Professor Wang Jinhui's Beijing apartment, and I was ready to begin my first herbal class in 1988. Okay? I had a backpack of books from the Chinese Medicine University. 
Uh, I, at that time, I was in the Chinese medical language program of the university. That's the feeder into the university, into the medical university. So you study Chinese medical theory in Chinese before going into the university. I had a backpack full of, the, of books from the Chinese medicine university. I was really ready to learn herbalism. And I thought I was just, I'm so excited. I'm in China. I'm 20. I got a backpack full of books. I'm in this old calligrapher's house and he's going to teach me herbs. And he looked at what I brought, kind of tilted his head sideways and said, come on. And we jogged down the steps of the building and out into the yard next to a coal heap. He, being in the Cultural Revolution, he was a poorly, he had a lot of problems. He was given the worst housing in the university. So he looked at the coal heap. Uh, he grabbed a plant right outside the building door. I mean, he literally grabbed it outside the door, handed it to me. He told me to look at it and then pick every single one for a hundred meters. Now, there's something you need to know about Andrew is I have some golden retriever in my DNA. Okay. I am so eager to please. I like to play. I like to please. I'm a happy person. So I picked up all these dirty plants that was going through the coal dust. Uh, you know, it's outside this Chinese building and this is the eighties. So people are walking on it, spitting on it, peeing on it. Uh, I mean, it, it was a scary time in the eighties. If you at all know what that was like. So I've got this handful of these plants. Professor Wong, we jog back up. He gives them a quick rinse. And I'm thinking, I am in so much trouble. Like I've just come to Asia. I've been there a few years now and I'm about to get hepatitis. I want to learn herbs. I'll take hepatitis. I'm watching this all happen, and I'm like that, right? He tosses it in, he simmers it for 15 minutes, and then he takes the whole pot, he puts it on his dinner table, right? Which is a fancy thing in China because the apartment's just a little table, right? And a ladle and two teacups. Shoop, shoop. He goes, huh, drink, right? And I had my first Copernican concussion as I realized we're not even going to open these books that I brought. The plant before the cart was my first Chinese herb, which is the literal name of Chu Tianzhao and Chu Tianzhe, the seed of it, right? He told me how because it grows along every roadside, absolutely everywhere, it was the easiest to get and thus the most important to use well. And he told me, skin problems, you simmer briefly, drink like a tea. Insomnia irritability, you simmer longer until bitter than drink the stronger brew. Rash or splinter or boils, mash the plant up until pulpy, apply topically. Only have it dry, soak in warm water until rehydrated. Mash, stick on topically. That was my first day. I didn't know what hit me, but I honestly left that evening convinced I could cure just about anything with Chu Chen I, I was just like, mash it, boil it, tincture it, you know, not tincture it, but you know, just tea and all of these things. I was like, ha ha. And then this continued. Next class was pugongi, right? Dandelions, ginger, scallions, unripe green oranges, yams, shanyao, Chinese crab apples, shanja, all with tips on whether to soak or boil or steep or smash in order to achieve different results. And so at the end of a month or two, I had 10, 12 herbs that I had learned to use five, 10 different ways, each single one to be able to think I could do absolutely everything. And as always, 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 he would be referring to Shen Nong tasting the herbs to identify their flavor in nature, to know their action as well as whether they could be relied on for health, illness, or in between, or the Shang Zhong Xia of the Shen Nong Ban Sao, the three layers. Now, unfortunately, as I told you, I have some retriever in me. So while I am eager, I am not the cleverest of dogs, right? Eager to please, not so smart. I didn't get like the Australian Shepherd, right? So my overly educated didactic brain kicked in because I come from a background of, of that kind of education. And I lost weeks and months after this beginning time period building databases of single herbs and their actions based on the books trying to make this learning syllabus, all of this information. And it, the further I went in, it just got harder and harder to learn. Starting as I did with picking and drinking herbs, I thought it was easy, right? 
But as I tried to memorize more and more herbs I'd never seen, I'd never felt them in my body, I'd never tasted, the less I knew. I foolishly created my own single herb class. How many of us have had to sit through like the one year of single herbs? Right? Yeah, I mean, come on. Oh, I know. But I mean, it's still, it's like, there they are, 300 herbs by the end of your two semesters, and you may never have really done anything with them. Nobody was picking them in the yard and smashing them up for you and having this intimate relationship. And so I was skipped that entire thing, and then I did it to myself. I created that class. Uh, so what started as non-confusing got to be completely overwhelming, and I experienced a negative Copernican concussion. I just went the wrong way. Now, my teachers, uh, I was there—I was like the happy foreigner, so I was their pet foreigner. They're like, look at my cute foreigner. He's really smiley, and he has a car, so he can drive us around the city. It was very helpful in those days. Uh, but they were very patient. And they saw me trying to memorize so many herbs without context and becoming worse and worse at it, that they explained that an herb without context is like a cart without wheels. It sits there doing nothing. I was walked through the Shanghan and the Jinkwei formulas, and I had concussion number three. Herbalism is a team sport, right? It's not meant to be individual, it's a team sport. And by combining the correct herbs together, we can treat successfully. My retriever kicks in again, and next thing you know, I am building formula databases instead of single herb databases. Ouch. <laughs> Studying single herbs as an intellectual exercise and a course by itself without the context of patients and illness is the first wrong direction we have taken in our study of herbalism today, the Copernican inversion. Uh, traditionally, before you even knew anything about the herbs, You'd be sitting there copying them, copying them, seeing patients take them. You wouldn't even know what they were yet. And then you'd be reading them at home, but always seeing in the clinic, clinic, clinic. And the teacher would say, okay, now come back in a month when you've memorized these herbs. But always seeing them first. You would see patients before you even knew what the herbs did so that you would have that. People are getting better. People are getting better. People are getting a lot better. People are getting worse. This one died. This one lived. And they were taking these herbs and getting these treatments. And then you begin to see more and more clearly, oh, they took these herbs. Oh, they had that treatment. But it started with just seeing people get better or worse. So in the way we have it today, only the most intellectually minded can remember those details. While most of us take the class, pass the tests, and are really not that much wiser for the time spent. And at this point, most get off the herbalism train, right? The, you had to take the course, you took the course, you graduate, and we default to an acupuncture-only practice with a few classic patents for cold and flu season, menopause, we got a little shaya san, insomnia patients, we've got a little tian wang bushi dan, something like that, and that's what we have. But enough do keep going on that train that they make a concerted effort to start memorizing single formulas, which is the same wrong direction, just harder. Because now we have to remember a group of herbs connected to an action of the formula instead of a single herb. But it's exciting. Now we're learning the real thing, the formulas. Okay? So unfortunately, when the dust settles of the excitement, there's still very little connection with the real problems of real patients in the real world. We lose perspective to such a degree that we, upon graduation, write down all of the single herbs in all the famous formulas we studied, and then we buy them to have our own pharmacy, right? I mean, how smart's that? Look up all the greatest formulas, buy those herbs so you can fill those formulas for our patients. But most of the time, those formulas don't really fit. We're also at the beginning of our practice, so we're staying up at night filling famous formulas for patients to pick up the next day. Results aren't that great. They complain about the taste. And within a year or two, most of the herbs we bought never got used. They're still sitting there. And we're losing too much personal time. And those herbs are taking too much space. So we end up with patents. Now, we have all those famous formulas squished into little pills, which are easier to store and easier for patients to take. And 
probably in another six months to a year, we figure out we didn't need to stock the variety we began with. So we end up with a small pharmacy of pill medicines, usually the ones that we get lucky with and with a patient and now believe that one really works. All right. As well as the greatest hits of formulas, Resilient Warrior, Free and Easy Wanderer, Cold Snap. Do you guys carry Cold Snap, that one? Um, oh, there you go. I know that's, that's our claim. I asked the front. Hey, front. Um, but if there is Cold Snap, at some point, buy it because they're the first people to be honest. You flip over the bottle or read the directions. I keep an empty one in my clinic just to read to people because it says, take three, uh, take eight pills three times a day. or Forget absolutely everything you've been told. And the long and short of it is they say, take a huge amount all the time until you feel better. I mean, it's right there in the bottle. Like, finally, somebody speaks up and says, you know, you're not going to get better with eight pills of Jininhua by itself when you're really sick. It's just, it just, it doesn't work. You have to just take mega doses, right? So cold snap is forever in my, my gratitude for being honest. Emperor's tea pills, Romania 6. I mean, we all know the greatest hits of those things. After we settle into a routine, we end up telling patients and believing ourselves that patents can work, but they have to be taken a long time to nudge or shift the constitution of the patient. And, you know, honestly, some patients do get better to justify this belief, this practice, right? But we have to be clear. The results we can get from T-pill pharmacy will never get near what the Naging demands of us to be even the lowest ranked doctor. The Naging is clear. Six out of 10, you get to call yourself a low ranked doctor, a shagong, right? I mean, that's a good, you know, that's holding the bar high. It's not 10%. It's not 30%. It's not even 50%, which Zhang Zhongjing makes a reference in his preface. He says, you know, if you use his book, you might get to half of your patients get better. He's purposely staying below that six out of 10 line out of humility. Um, but the only way we can get past that five out of 10 marker is if we practice what we preach, which is Chinese medicine is an individualized medicine. It's based on each individual patient we have. We must customize our treatments and not blindly follow protocols and we must customize the herbs they take and not rely on pre-made formulations. Now, both protocols and pre-made formulations have their place. It's why they're famous. It's why they're here. They work. We use both in our clinic, but it's important to know that the pre-made formulations, patents or otherwise, it's when the shoe fits, that's when we use it. But what's really important to know is that if we want to move into a more immediate, tangible, successful practice, not financially, but uh, illness-wise, we can't, if the shoe doesn't fit, we can't try to stick it on our patient's feet anyway, right? It's not the right shoe, don't use it. Now, I was fortunately concussed back to my herbal roots uh, after a few years of study when I developed a truly nasty skin rash. Uh, I was out in rural China for weeks at a time, I was around livestock, muck, uh, this is being filmed, but who cares? I'll tell you the story anyways. So it's all outdoor toilets, uh, you know, cement, plank, you squat, and we were there in the day, and as you're sitting there bored, you look, and it's full of maggots trying to climb up the sides. And it becomes a game. You watch them come up, and they get, what happens is they leave the water, and as it gets drier up the sides of the cement, they fall down, Right. So you sit there and you have diarrhea because you're in rural China. So you sit there a long time. I'm sorry, I'm telling you this story. Uh, and you just watch them climb and fall. And then you go at night. And you know they're doing the same thing. And you start to think, is one of them going to make it? <laughs> it's a terrible moment of fear. You're like, ah, uh, and this is before cell phones, right? So, uh, so I developed this nasty, I'm around parasites. I mean, it's, it's, it's rural China, right? So. I make it back to Beijing for a few days. I show my rash to my teacher and he goes, ah. And uh, he said, if we go to the doctors at the famous pharmacy, um, purposely not saying that really famous pharmacy in Beijing that's been there since the Qing dynasty. Sorry, uh, I like to give them a hard time. They have great patents, but the clinical side 
is if you become a doctor there, it's sort of a badge, like you get to brag, but you're under contract to write very expensive formulas. And if you don't, you have to leave. So he said, if we take you there, you are going to get all sorts of expensive herbs and you'll get better slowly. Don't be that doctor. He looked at me. He said, Rui, be a Confucian practitioner of uh, a, a doctor, someone who's worried about the person, the individual. Learn to write cheap herbs, simple herbs that work and the poor can afford. He wrote me a formula that cost less than 50 cents, told me how to drink it, and I returned to where I was staying at the time in the countryside. I boiled up my first bag in the evening, and I woke with a white, non-itchy rash instead of the mean red one I'd gone to bed with. Overnight, I was looking at it. 50 cents. A few dollars and a week later, it was completely gone. And I went, oh, it's not about these herbs are magic or this is something else. It's he chose to write a cheap formula, and it worked, not because it was cheap or expensive. So what's important to know about herbalism is it, it's a hard route if we try to do it intellectually like a school class. It's also hard to get good at if we have to do it on our own. I began with a dirty plant picked outside the door, and I continued by copying down the formulas my, teacher were, my teachers were using day in, day out for years and years and years. And so I saw it in practice. But please, I stress this every time, don't let anyone fool you into thinking it takes years and years to learn how to do this. That's just not true at all. We can learn to do this very quickly. We then spend time maturing, getting better at it. But we don't take years until finally being like, oh, now I get it. We need to get this quickly and then practice so we can mature. It's not hard because once you're put on the right path, it's easy. The reason why we wanna keep working with experienced teachers is to see what is possible in terms of types of diseases treated and the dosage amounts of herbs used in chronic versus acute conditions. It's really important because uh, the old famous doctor is going to get the scarier cases and then you get to see dosages and herb use that we just won't be able to get to see in our own clinics until we become that person, right? The expression in Chinese is jian guai bu guai, or when we see strange things, it's no longer strange. Xin xi dan da is the next expression we really have to learn in this medicine, which in the context of medicine means meticulous of diagnosis, brave in treatment. When we see this in action by teachers and witness the results of their treatments, it's no longer strange for us to write a custom formula and expect tangible results. Very quickly, it becomes strange that somebody wouldn't write a custom formula for someone. Why wouldn't you write exactly what that person needs? Because that's what we've seen. And we're not seeing a patent practice, and therefore that seems strange to me. So, what is the easy path to breaking out of patents and standard formulas and into custom form as we write? Now, the first thing to really understand is that no one was originally learning the way we attempt to learn herbs now. Uh, it's not fair. If you are a famous person, doctor, and people give you students all the time, and these are really, sometimes they're very important people, you can't say no. That's awful. Like you, you're, they, like you, you can get what I'm trying to say of the obnoxious young person who doesn't want to be there, but their father is a really important government official. So you say, yes, of course, I'll take your son. And then you hand him a stack and say, when you have it all memorized, come back. Out it goes into the world. And that's your reputation. But that was just to get rid of the student. For the people that were trying to teach, nobody was taught that way, right? Um, we have to copernicate. I'm trying to coin a term now. Copernicate, right? And we're going to return to flavor and nature understanding of herbs. It's how they were understood in the Neijing. It's how the famous formulas were created. And that is what we must do if we expect to get the results our medical ancestors got. Because if we venerate what they were doing, we should try and do what they were doing the way they did it. And then we can modify and change according to modern times. I've got no problems with that. But we can't take off on modernizing it without their knowledge and foundations, because that's what they had to get what we venerate, right? 
Now, the second thing that we must grasp is that our patients need a flavor and a nature. They do not need a specific herb or formula. We have to figure out what flavor in nature and in what combinations we need. And then we look at our herbal shelf, right? And we grab the herbs that are closest to what we need in flavor and nature. We don't need guajer. We need warm acrid. Guajer is a really convenient warm acrid herb. So we use it. But we don't need guajer. We need warm acrid. That's what that patient needs. We don't need huanglian or dangshan. We need cold bitter or we need sweet neutral. All right. Once we start grasping that, we become very free. One of the things we hear the most is people who come to our clinic, they look at the formulas we're writing and they say, but that's not a classic formula. And I'll say, what do you mean? That's guajer tang or that's mashi yigan tang or that's whatever it is. And they go, no, it's not. And I say, ah, you're looking at herb names. Look at the flavor of nature. And then if they happen to know flavor of nature, they look at it afterwards, they go, oh, look, warm acrid, cool sour, sweet, sweet spicy, right? And they go, oh, so it's so important. The third thing we need to gain, and it's a basic understanding of what the plants are and thus how intense or mild their flavor and natures are going to be. Because just because we have 20 herbs that are warm acrid doesn't mean they're going to do the same thing. And the books talk about it, thick, thin, light, heavy, lots of information that we'll talk about in a minute. Now. When we understand the plant's basic nature on top of its flavor nature, we can understand that ginseng, renshan, it's so effective because the root, it's a root that takes years and years to grow in a shady environment. So it's had years to soak up lots of yin nourishment. Because, you know, today, a lot of the renshan is very hot and they do it, you know, there's galiang renshan and things like that. But traditionally, if you look at the old books, it was a nourishing yin, cool, sweet herb, if you look at how it was used in the Shanghai Lun. So we're cooking this thick root and it means there's more thickness or strength in the flavor because it had seven years to suck up nourishing things. Shi Tian Cao, or plantain, which is how I began my career uh, picking that plant, it grows quickly and it goes from moist to dry, and it bolts quickly, and it can grow in very shallow soil. It grows anywhere. So in a serious condition, it doesn't have that strength unless we use a lot of it, a lot, a lot of it, because it's a little weed growing on the side of the road. Gentle, sure. Big illness, better pick a whole lot of it and smash up a whole lot of it because it hasn't had much time to do something. Now, seeds, they can be oily, and we can say they're moistening, but if we don't grind them, the oil isn't really released and their moistening property doesn't happen. And we say seed in English, but are we really talking about a nut or a seed? So shingren, right? Uh, 10 grams of shingren is a common dose that we're going to see, apricot kernels. But the thing that we need to understand is that they're kernels, not seeds. They're heavy. So 10 grams is not very much. And if we miss that the formula in the old book says 70 kernels, in your formula. It doesn't say, oh, wait. It says, count them out, 70 of them. Clip the ends, peel it, 70 of them. And we think, and we only use 10 grams because that's what the book says or our teachers say, we're really hindering the oily moistening effect that the book mentions to calm the lungs that Shinran has. Because we can weigh out 70 grams right here, and we're going to find out 70 kernels is a little more than 10 grams. So we have to know what we're holding, right? 10 grams of a little seed, maybe a whole lot because of volume, right? So it's important to know what they are. Is what we're prescribing a food like shanyao, which is wild yams, or maimandong, the little tubers, right? We then need to understand that we need to hit a mega dose to make it medicinal, or we have to have a chronic condition that we can have our patients take for months and months as a nice tasting food to be effective as medicine for them. We have to know what it is. Or is it toxic? And a small amount for just a few days is critical to success, but should be stopped. It's not a long-term herb. We need to just be thinking this way. What is the plant itself? Not just its flavor in nature, but when we look at it. How does it taste? What does it weigh? How thick is it? Is it oily? Is it light? What is it? What does it boil up like? Will it thicken our formula the way Ee Ren or Jingni might? 
Uh, E.E. Ren's a barley in the family. Jingmi's rice. Both are starchy. Or is it so thin in flavor like fooling that it will be lost among strong flavors we prescribe if we don't think about what other herbs are in the formula? Or is it sweet and sticky? So it's going to give nourishment to someone who's not eating. And that sweet, sticky, like dadzao, for instance, uh, is going to go in and it's going to give them nourishment. And that patient is going to feel so much better the next day. But the same dadzao is going to clog up the digestion of someone who has an appetite. So we have to be thinking these ways. Know the plant. It's not just warm, sweet, or whatever it is. We have to know what it is. We just have to start understanding the plant and the flavor in nature. Now, finally, the, our fourth cornerstone to becoming what I call a no-nonsense herbalist uh, is what is the best delivery mechanism on hand? What do we need for this patient? Is the illness severe and the patient is at home full-time so they can take stronger herbs several times a day and they have the time to do so? Or are they sick but still active, needing a lighter brew made in a French press or a teapot to change their condition while maintaining their busy lifestyle? Does it have to taste good? Or does it need to be really bitter to get the person's attention and make some changes? Do we need to provide the herbalist version of the carrot and a stick, alternating a strong bitter formula with a mild pleasant one? It's said that the study of Western philosophy is everything is a footnote to Aristotle. I'm saying that everything that follows in herbal formulations, famous formulas, teachers and books are footnotes to these four foundational principles. Return to flavor and nature practice. Stop believing we need a specific herb or that a specific herb does something and return to understanding that we need to affect a patient's chi flow through flavor and nature. The herb is irrelevant. Its flavor and nature is important. Three, start to get to know what the plants are instead of thinking of them as a name in a book with an action listed underneath. Taste them. Look at them. Keep it simple by experimenting with what is easy and what is not. What is toxic? What isn't? Try it. Then we can start to differentiate why we might pick one herb over another even though they have the same flavor in nature. And four, match intensity of formula and delivery method with the illness and the patient in front of us. Every treatment, every formula should strive to be the perfect judo flip. A good judo flip has a pull with the arm, a sweep with the leg, and a pivot with the hips, right? And that's what makes it look effortless. But exactly how and where to place the arm, the hip, and the leg depends on whether the opponent is bigger than we are or smaller than we are? Is charging at us, or are we charging at the opponent? Right? Is the opponent actively aggressive, or is the, pay, is the opponent passive? That All of those are going to completely vary how I go in and do my flip. And I need to look at my delivery methods and my intensities the same way. What is the perfect match to this situation? 